Welcome. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And I am your host, Liv. She who doesn't normally care for Rome, unless brilliant people like the partial historians do all of the work for me. (laughs) And that is exactly what today is. As Michaela told me when she'd edited this episode, the partial historians make Rome fun. Which is what they are here to do today. I spoke with the wonderful ladies, Dr. Rad and Dr. G, the hosts of the podcast, The Partial Historians all about Rome's first kings and their book about, well, Rome's first kings. This is mythology and history and so much Rome. We had such a fun time and these ladies shared so many fascinating things that I didn't know because, again, I don't pay enough attention to Rome. But I do like it when other people come on and tell me things about Rome so that I don't have to research it. I just get to learn, you know? (laughs) The partial historians are always sharing the fascinating and fun and honestly, probably more often than not, like dark as hell history of Rome through their podcast. But they've also written this book. Their new book is called Rex, the Seven Kings of Rome. And well, you could assume what it's about. But fortunately, they joined me this week to share stories from those early kings of Rome in their usual style. We had so much fun and I got to learn about Rome. <laughs> Plus, it's just always so lovely to talk to Dr. Rad and Dr. G. If you don't listen to their podcast, you really should. Especially if you love Rome and you wish I'd talk about it more. Like, that is what they are here for. conversations. They make Rome fun. Rome's first kings with the partial historians. Um, well, yeah, I mean, we're talking about this because you guys wrote a book, which is super cool. And now you're going to talk to me about it because it features the ancient world. So thanks for coming on, you wonderful (laughs) partial historians. That's my incredibly professional introduction that will absolutely stay in the podcast. That sounds good. Yeah. Love it. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, I always love to have you guys. It's always so fun. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. And we're pretty excited to talk to you about this book because it deals with the Roman kings, which is almost as mythic as you can get when it comes to something that's also included in Roman history. So, <laughs> you know, we're on the knife edge here. Yeah. Segway, yeah, so, segue, I mean, segue. <laughs> <laughs> I, I obviously, I think based on my, most of my listeners are going to know this about me because I talk about it way too often, but like, I don't know a lot about Rome. Rome's cool. In my head, Rome is just Greece adjacent. And like, I like to talk about Ovid and I have done some stuff with the Aeneid that I won't say I like it, but I have read it. Um, <laughs> and I think that's, that's a of, very fair call when it comes thank to you. Virgil. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, and so basically, that's my whole knowledge on ancient Rome, other than what you and or the uh, ancient history fangirl has told me. And without <laughs> four of you, I'm just at a complete loss. So Tell me about the Roman kings and your book and basically anything and everything that you want to say. (laughs) Absolutely. Well, basically, we have we decided that after finishing that period in our podcast, where, as you know, we tell a a narrative history of Rome 90 percent of the time, we decided that we really did want to actually record our version of each king's reign and delve into what we think is real, what we think isn't. But mostly we wanted to focus on look, whether these stories are real or not, what do they tell us about the way that the Romans see themselves? Ooh. Yeah. That's the good stuff with the ancient world is like the context around it more than even the stories itself sometimes. Yeah. Well, because our major sources are Livy for me and Dionysus of Halicarnassus for Dr. G on a regular basis. And they're writing a lot later. They're writing in the late Republic and early Imperial period. So it's always been really fascinating to us to see 
the overlap between their own period and the way that they choose to tell the story of the kinks. And I'll let Dr. G say something now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because like a lot of our written sources for the kings actually come from about sort of 600, 700 years after the kings themselves. So we've got like this huge chunk of time. It's a bit like somebody today going around and being like, you know, I'm really interested in Shakespeare and then just <laughs> talking to some people and hoping they stumble across some inscriptions to help them out with Shakespeare, not necessarily having any manuscript that Shakespeare ever produced and then not having access to the internet and being like, you know what, this is what people say about Shakespeare. He was a little bit rotund and he come from Stratford-upon-Avon. Amazing stuff. And he wrote plays. And everyone's <laughs> like, oh, that's a cool story. And so we've got this sense that there's a real gap between what happened and then what people end up writing down about it. And it's both interesting and unfortunate for us as historians that the writers like Livy and Dionysius of Halicarnassus are relying on earlier writers who no longer survive for us. So mm -hmm. we've got no way to sort of independently go back and sort of be like, oh, yeah, that guy was saying some stuff that was just mad, insane, and I'm glad that made it into the story, but I don't think it was real. And we also get this sense that there's a real oral tradition coming through in the way that these stories are recorded. You get those sort of themes of like power and balance and the good kings versus the bad kings and everybody has very equal lengths to their reigns, hmm. which is kind of fascinating. We're dealing with this sort of 250 year period and everybody has a rule that's about 35 years long. And you're like, hmm. what are the odds yeah. mathematically <laughs> that that would be true? Uh, so there's lots of interesting sort of quirks about this period that we're really interested in. I love that. I mean, that's like something that comes up so much for me too, right? Is like, I mean, and especially when it comes to even Roman sources, like right now, the thing that's taking up every minute of brain space that I have is I'm doing this big series on Sparta and I'm looking at the origins and I'm like, okay, cool. So literally all we have about Lycurgus, whether he was real or not, comes from Plutarch. Like how unhelpful is that? And it sounds like exactly the same kind of thing of like trying to piece out what's real, what's not real, when what you have is a source from 700 years later that may or may not just be bullshitting the whole thing or be working off of sources that we don't have and yet would provide like all this extra like either confirmation or dis you know disproving of whatever it is they're saying it's it's both my favorite part about working with ancient sources and the absolute worst part about working <laughs> with ancient sources <laughs> well i'm really glad you mentioned plutarch because he's actually the other big source for us so perfect uh yeah keep that in mind because <laughs> He does write a life of Romulus and a life of Numa, the first two kings, and then mm. he does not care at all about the rest of them. <laughs> Perfect. So Romulus is the first, of, I mean, in my head he like he is, but he in my head is so mythical that I guess I didn't consider him that he would ever like count as like a first king of Rome. So he but oh. he is the yeah, first. well, even more than that, Dr. G wants to throw Remus into the mix as well. Make, make them both kings. Why not? Why not? Hand out crowns for everyone. <laughs> Technically, my cat is named Remus Lupin, even though uh, there's a certain reason why I prefer not to say that uh, often. But he is 15, and I did name him 15 years ago. Uh, but that does mean that he technically does have that as a first name. So I've got a little, a little appreciation nice. for that. I like it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of Rome in your household all the time. Exactly. I mean, there's a lot of Greek, so we might as well offset it with just like a tiny bit of Rome. <laughs> yeah. So like Romulus, they reckon he's the first king. And fair enough. I mean, there's definitely that huge foundation story, which does involve the murder of his own twin brother, Remus. Yeah, so a guy. little bit unfortunate. But when you delve into that story... Actually, Remus and Romulus are both looking to found a city together, but then they have a bit of a disagreement about which hill it should be on. Uh, not that the site's particularly exciting. <laughs> like everything sort of dips down into this marshy valley, which is pretty unattractive and full of malaria. So, you know, it's a great spot. Perfect. But, but they're kind of ideal like, which city. hill? Yeah, yeah. Ideal place <laughs> for a city. Um, it will go places, believe me. And so Remus is sitting on one hill being like, I reckon this is the hill. I'm going to look for a sign here. And Romulus is on another hill being like, nah, bro, over here. And they fight it out and they have a real disagreement about 
the divine signs that they see and interpret. Can but I make a really bad joke? Oh, please is, do. <laughs> is one of these a hill that one of them is willing to die on? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> I think Good you one might be right. <laughs> Willing, not willing, someone's going to die. Yeah, you know. know. Yeah, yeah. There are definitely hills and death involved. Perfect. (laughs) That's where the saying comes from. There we go. (laughs) I just recently confirmed with a friend of mine, like, I didn't think about this, but I told the story of of Agamemnon coming home from the Trojan War and Clytemnestra and the red carpet. And my friend's like, who is like not an ancient history person, but thankfully really likes to listen to me. Um, And he was like, is that where we get the saying of the rolling out the red carpet? And I was like, I don't know. And we Googled it. And it is. And I love that so much because it's (laughs) so dark. And it's like the idea of rolling out the red carpet. But really, it's like your husband's coming home from war and you're going to kill him. Um, And that's the red carpet. So, you know, we it could be a hill willing to die on is coming be. from Remus because it doesn't have to be good or bad, I guess. All this time, we didn't know. Yeah. I mean, it's really quite possible, and I will now have to investigate further. Uh, there you should could. be a spinoff miniseries, Where Did These Phrases Come From? And it yeah. turns out yeah. death and destruction in the ancient world. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, Romulus and Remus, they disagree, and ultimately... Uh, Remus seems to think that Romulus has lied. This is one of the popular accounts. It's not the only version of this story, but one of them suggests that Remus has a legitimate sign from the gods that he interprets and Romulus tries to one up him by lying and then gets his bro crew to back him up because they're like, I oh, know, we got to be on our on our boy's side. And Remus is like, what? That's ridiculous. And so Romulus wins the argument and starts founding the city by building a wall and digging a first furrow, which is very important. And Remus is like, you know what? You suck. This wall sucks. This furrow is stupid. (laughs) And he's just basically wandering around, like kicking stuff over, being like, look, I jumped from one side to the other side. Doesn't mean anything. Whatever. And this enrages Romulus and he ends up killing his own brother. And so maybe Remus was the king, but not for very long. <laughs> yeah, so so we end up so we end up getting Romulus as the first king of Rome. And he's obviously quite exalted as being the first, but he does get up to a bunch of really terrible stuff. We don't we won't go into heaps of detail, but there is a kidnapping of mm. innocent women who he's tricked into coming to games at Rome. And this leads us to another person who's often overlooked as a king of Rome, and that is a guy called Titus Tatius. Mm, Titus Tatius. So he's often left off the list, but he should not be left off the <laughs> kingly list. So I'm trying to reinstate Titus Tatius and make that happen for him because this guy needs to be more known about. And so he is the leader of the Sabines. He's the king of the Sabines, this neighbor of Rome, and it's a lot of their women have been caught up in this whole abduction situation. So they're very unhappy about that. And so Titus Tatius leads the charge to sort of bring down the Romans and to like get back the women. It's classic Roman setting up its patriarchy stuff. And something new and different. Oh yeah. Well, you, you co- I mean, it's Rome. I mean, start the ancient early. World, they weren't, they weren't any better or worse than Greece for that. <laughs> no, terrible times. And There are other cities who are involved in this and other women who were taken from other areas, but they all fall in the face of uh, Romulus's military might. And it's Titus Tatius and the Sabine forces that actually bring Rome to heel a little bit. And at that point, he becomes the co-king of Rome with Romulus. And it seems like he does this for about five years before he seems to be suspiciously bumped off. (laughs) So he like, even though he's from this like kind of neighboring area and fighting with them, does officially like get to be a part of things. Yeah, well, it's interesting. Is... Yeah. No, you go. Yeah. No, sorry. I was going to say this is the weird thing about Roman kingship, and something that you might not automatically think of because most of us, the most famous royal family we know of is of course the British royal family, and that's hereditary. So we tend to think of kingship as being automatically hereditary. But that's not the case with Rome. It's kind of an elected process. But on top of that, when you actually look at all the kings as a whole, like none of them come from Rome, basically. They're all outsiders in some way. Their background is, they're often from people that are close to Rome, but 
not Rome. And so it's actually been suggested by some academics that it might have even almost have been a requirement that you were not actually from Rome to be the king of Rome. Mm. So it's kind of weird like that. Reminds me of the two different types of like the two different names for king in Greek. It's not like obviously as cut and dry in between the two names, but like just Tyrannos versus Basileus. And it yeah. sounds like Rome's got a lot more of the Tyrannos vibes. <laughs> I think so. I think so. Yeah. That definitely will keep by the happening. time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Definitely by the time you get to the later kings, this is where you start to get the sense that actually they are kind of some they're often labeled tyrants i'm just gonna say it they're often labeled tyrants (laughs) particularly the last guy he is labeled a tyrant and you definitely do get a sense of actually whilst this guy doesn't sound like a great person because you know he sees power in a coup and all and he did help to murder his father-in-law it's not great he threw an elderly man down the stairs never good but (laughs) at the same time it does almost seem like he was potentially holding power and challenging the power of the aristocrats of Rome, potentially. So you mm. do get that tyrannical vibe coming through in the in the ancient sense of the word, I suppose. So, yeah. Yeah, clear that that, or just to remind listeners of, the our modern word of tyrant comes from a long line of changes to the word based on the original meaning of just kind of seizing power versus actually being tyrannical in the way we think of it. Yes, exactly, yes. But for the most part, the Roman kings are elected, as uh, Dr. Rad was saying. And and once Romulus dies, uh, also in suspicious circumstances, as it turns out, but after a long time in power, uh, they do have this period that they call the period of the interrex in between kings, where they have Mm -hmm. a kind of a rotating system of aristocrats kind of taking power just for like a certain period of time, quite short, sometimes a week, sometimes a month. Um, it depends on our sources again, where their job is to try to figure out who will be the next king. So they're kind of like a placeholder. So there's this Mm. sense that Rome cannot be kingless in this early period. And so they have to fill that role with an intermediary while they try to figure out what to do and who will really take on the role, which is kind of fascinating because it's very bureaucratic and sets up that sort of, uh, officious mindset that comes through in ancient Rome in later times as well. So we're all a little bit hazy about what's going on here, but it's a bit like Romulus... the British Prime Minister situation, really. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's about right. Yeah. How Just many lettuces have we gone through next. now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so I mean they have this period of the interrex, the first interrex it goes on for like a year and people are apparently really upset about that because they're like, well when are we going to get an actual king rather than just being ruled by all of these aristocrats all the time? It's like we exchanged one person in power for like hundreds of people in power and this is really terrible for us. And they eventually settle upon a guy called Numa. And he's also a Sabine. So Hmm. the second king is definitely not from Rome. And I I think it's fair to say that Romulus couldn't have possibly been from Rome, um, having been (laughs) the founder of the city. Yeah. And so Numa is like this philosophical king, whereas Romulus is this really military, bro-ish kind of guy. Numa comes across as like the sensitive intellectual and famously wanders in the forest and picks up advice from a local nymph uh, who comes to him, Egeria, and she lets him know how the gods need to be serviced appropriately to make the city work well. There's a definite crossover for us there, Liv. People who have had relationships with gods and or <laughs> goddesses. <laughs> yeah, they always make the right decisions, I would say. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Ajiria yeah. is all over this. She definitely knows what's going on. She makes it really clear that it's really important for Rome to institute some priesthoods. Um, they seem to have had some, but maybe weren't running them properly. And she's like, look, here's some <laughs> advice. Set up the all of these different groups. You need some augurs. You need some pontifices. You definitely need some vestal virgins. Get that situation in order and tidy up this whole place. And so Numa spends a lot of his time when he's not hanging out with her trying to convince the people that maybe there's more to life than just uh, killing our neighbors and uh, making other people angry. (laughs) Now, how does it work? Like, 
we're talking such early days. So do they have any kind of um, explanation on how they develop their religion when this is like a new city? Like, I'm just so curious in that, like thinking of, oh yeah, they should have some Vestal Virgins, but it's like, okay, so where did they get Vestal Virgins? Like, obviously, you know, I mean, I'm sure you have this answer, but also we have the combination of like the Greek and then I'm sure there's so much influence by the, um, oh, this is where my brain is today. The the people of Italy before Rome and during, the, is it? Is <laughs> no, the, it is. It yeah, is a mix. Yes. Etruscans. Yeah. I got it. I got it. Etr- yeah. <laughs> thinking of Etruscans. Thank you. Uh, but yeah, so, you know, like, how does it all come together that they kind of develop their version of who's going to have priesthoods and why and Vestal Virgins and all of that? I think oh, it's really important heavily. to stress. <laughs> yeah, it's really yeah. important to stress with this that our written sources aren't giving us anything like what we think is an accurate picture of how this is evolving. Yeah, and so, so they're kind of, they're probably working off their current model and like putting it on back in time, right? Yeah, they're doing yeah. a lot of retrojection being like, how did that happen? <laughs> Yeah. The things that have fallen by the wayside or maybe aren't in practice anymore are just kind of left out of the story entirely, which is really unfortunate because we know Mm. the Etruscans are a huge group to the north of Rome and they have hundreds of years of influence in that area prior to Rome developing as far as we can tell. But there is also Magna Graecia in the south and the influences that are coming through from that colonization process And then there also seems to be the indigent religions of the area of central Italy, which Mm. involves a whole bunch of people and different language groups, most of which don't survive the sort of the purge that's introduced by Latin becoming so dominant in the region. But there are all of these other groups and like there are Oscan speakers and there is a little group, and I can't remember what the language is called now, but there's a little group quite near the the western shore which speaks a language that doesn't seem to be related to any of them around them and we're like okay Mm. it's like there is a lot going on and we know that Hestia comes through for the ancient Greeks uh, quite early and Vesta seems to be a sort of parallel or interconnected with her in some way Mm -hmm. Romulus himself in a lot of these stories is born of a Vestal virgin um, Mm. and he's born in a town called Alba Longa so we know that Vestals are a kind of, there's this idea that they were around, they're not unique to Rome. They're actually of every place. Huh. And yeah, we get this sense of the Sibylline books coming into knowledge of the mm. Romans as well. And I can't remember off the top of my head which king that happens under, but I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure, sure it's Dr. Superbus. Radwell. Yeah. I think it's Superbus, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so the Sibylline books set up a whole bunch of things for them as well. And so there's this sense of this evolving religiosity that's going on for them. And, but how that's written up in the sources and how that actually was, it's a mess. No yeah. doubt about it. <laughs> yeah. They're definitely taking a little bit, I think, from various cultures around them as well as developing their own. And that's why I think it's just so complicated to try and tease out the strands in these much later sources. I mean, they might not even know themselves, to be honest, some of the time. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, it's such a common problem with the Greek stuff, too. You just have it. Rome is such an interesting difference in the way that, like, we do have these kind of ideas of it being founded as like a place. And it's a bit more obvious that it was kind of pulling from everywhere around it. Whereas all the different Greek city states, that not that they did just like spring up out of nowhere, but like it, we don't have as much of a kind of contextual idea surrounding that because it was just sort of a different way of developing these cities. Yeah. Well, like we've talked about in one of our previous chats that we've done, some of the Greek city-states, they have this idea that the people like are sprung from the soil, mm-hmm. you know, that they were always there. Whereas Rome, very clearly from the myth that it tells about its foundation, I mean, the whole idea of Romulus is that he's like, right, right here, this is where it's going to happen. Anybody who wants to join me, come join me. You know, 
runaway slaves, people that, you know, need a fresh start in life. You're all welcome. It's an asylum. Come and join me. And so even in that, you can kind of see how they're just pulling from everywhere. They're kind of welcoming a lot of different things in. And yeah, so even in that kind of foundation story, you get this idea that Rome is drawing on lots of different places, yeah. even in its people. So of course, it's going to have lots of different ideas as well, because who the hell knows where these people come from? <laughs> Well, and then you add in the like later and or si- sometimes simultaneous like I- inclusion of Aeneas and then the explicit like, oh, well, actually half of them come from Troy or the like sort of original origins are Troy. And then, yeah, so it it really is so much more explicitly kind of pulling from all of these different places. It's so interesting. Yeah, you can see the Romans like getting out the tape and being like, right, <laughs> yeah. we're going to stick that together and then we're going <laughs> to stick that together and somehow we're going to have an illustrious foundation story. <laughs> And it's, there are multiple foundation stories for sure. And like you've touched upon it with this idea of Aeneas and it's like this pre-pre-foundation where it's like it goes right back to the Trojan War and then you've got the hero Evander who we don't go into at all but mm. is considered to be an early precursor of the foundation as well. And so they spend all of this time trying to connect themselves into the other stories that are part of the region. And then we get the kings and they're just this sort of uh, crop of like really interesting and contrasting characters that do feel like a storybook and you do get that sense that there is a really long oral tradition uh, connected with these figures but they do also at the same time start to feel a little bit more historical the further into the list we get and yeah. I think that's telling us something as well whereas like <laughs> There's the hazy parts for the Romans and then they sort of hit upon some bits where they're like, oh, I'm feeling more confident about this story. I think this one might have happened. Let's let's jump in because there are a couple of kings. Like so after Numa, we have Tullus Hostilius and Ancus Marcius, these two kings that almost nothing is written about by anybody um, that has survived. I think Livy passes over one of these in like maybe a couple of paragraphs, which is like devastating because he spends pages and pages on others and you're like did really nothing happen in this guy's rule and it's like you know he was around for 25 years and did yeah, like something nothing. happened yeah i'm like, sure something had to have happened <laughs> was he just a nice guy is this what happens to nice guys <laughs> well, Tullus Hostilius is really just romulus 2.0 <laughs> he's, he's mm. hasn't really got his own personality <laughs> he is kind of horrible that's true yeah yeah <laughs> But yeah, Angus Marcius, as you say, he is just like, he's like so balanced that he doesn't get much attention because I do he write a really whole chapter on him though. Yeah. So I, know, I, do, he I do try to salvage him, but it's tough. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't do anything horrible and he does some okay things, like okay, good, but nothing fantastic. So. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, that leaves us with like where we get into the, re- the really interesting last few kings and. That brings us to Lucius Tarquinius Priscus. And Priscus is, he's a pretty fun character. Roman names are so wild. Yeah, they, they <laughs> are. And this is so wild. <laughs> and this one's even better than usual because it's not even his real name. It's, it's mostly, he was born Lucamo, according to our stories. God bless. Which sounds like a Beach Boys song. It does. <laughs> It really does. <laughs> it does. It does. And Lucamo is born in Tarquinii, which is an Etruscan city. So that's mm. where the Tarquinius comes into it. And he ends up marrying a woman, Tanaquil. And these two are like super ambitious. And he's really interested in getting into Etruscan politics. And he's inherited a whole stash of cash. And he's ready to go. But because his dad was a Greek, the Etruscans are kind of like, you're not quite good enough to be in Etruscan politics. Um, outsider. <laughs> outsider. It's like a very Greek thing to say. Yeah. It's, but it's really painful, I think, for Lucamo because he was born in Tarquinii. He was raised as an Etruscan. And to get to the mm. point where it's like, it's his time to shine. And he's like, okay, guys, I've got the cash. I got the woman. She's from an elite Etruscan family. I'm ready to go build my empire. They're like, nah, bro, you, you don't even fit. It wouldn't matter Mm. how rich you were. It's never going to work out. And he's like devastated. And then he's angry. And then Tanaquil is angry with him. And she's like, fuck those guys. 
I've lived here all of my life. They're all, they're all dicks and they're less good than you. So let's go. <laughs> let's go somewhere else. And they decide that they're going to move to Rome because, as Dr. Rad was saying, that it's this place of asylum and it's really opening and welcoming. And they're like, you want to live a good life? You want to try something new? Come to, come to Rome. Uh, we've got malaria, but we've also got hills. It could be the land of opportunity. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's going to be amazing. And yeah. so they're like, that's it. Let's uh, quit Tarquinii and get out of there. And they're going across and the separation between Etruscan land and Latin territory seems to be the Tiber River at, at its most, mm. at the extent. So Rome in the beginning is on the kind of the sort of southish side of that bank and everything on the other side is considered Etruscan. And so they hit the Janiculum Hill, which is technically on the Etruscan side, and it's looking out over the city. And so even though today that's definitely part of Rome proper, in the beginning it was not. And so they're looking out and they're like, ah, oh, we've finally arrived. The opportunity is here. And then before they could do anything else, they're looking out and they're like, this is great. An eagle swoops down out of a cloud and like, oh, God, <laughs> grabs Lucamo's hat off his head and flies away with it. And they're like, what the hell? And that then, sounds like a sign from Jupiter to me. Wait for it. Yeah, definitely a sign. <laughs> but wait, this sign is not complete. Tanaquil's ears are already pricked up. She's like, wait a minute. I'm sensing something. The eagle swoops back around. It's like, wah, wah, but now with the hat. <laughs> uh, drops the hat back on Lucamo's head, places it gently back, and then flies back off again. And Tanaquil's <laughs> like, this, this is a sign. And it turns out that she is highly trained in Etruscan augury, this reading of the godly signs. Mm. And she's like, this is it. This is, we need to come to Rome. You are going to become king of this town. This is what the bird has suggested with this whole thing with your hat. And Luca Mo's like, let's do it. We're on. And so it all begins for him. He's like, it's a brand new start. The gods are on my side. I've got my Tanaquil sign reader right next to me. What a great wife. Let's do it. I guess I got a flag because it's only just occurred to me how weird it is that this story involves a hat. I never think of the Romans wearing yeah, hats. I was trying to picture what a Roman hat would look like. and I physically cannot. Yeah, I mean, I know technically he, at this stage he's still a Etruscan or whatever. Yeah. But yeah, I, I don't picture ancient people wearing hats all that often. I, I want mean, it to be like have, a Phrygian cap. Because, yeah, I was going to say, we have the Phrygian yeah. cap, but uh, I'm guessing it looks slightly different from that. Well, yeah. and if he's Etruscan, he's not coming from Aeneas. So we don't even have the Phrygia connection. Yeah, exactly. Which I just wanted it to be because... But we should we definitely be inserting hat. the RuPaul song here of like, <laughs> this is the beginning, the beginning, this is the beginning <laughs> of the rest of your life. <laughs> I always think of it as a little bit of a chimney sweeps cap, but that's just me. Yeah. <laughs> he's coming up was... from nothing. Just you wait. <laughs> <laughs> I was just waiting for a snake to be involved because in in Greek signs from the gods, if an eagle is is involved, there's probably also going to be a snake. But I appreciate the hat. Yeah, sadly, yeah, no definitely. snakes in this case, but definitely a really stylish hat. However, yeah. you want to imagine it. <laughs> yeah, but he manages to become really buddy buddy with Ancus Marcius, who is the fourth king, who's like super balanced, nice guy. <laughs> Yeah, Priscus ends up becoming really uh, outstanding as a cavalry leader. So it turns out that, like, uh, Lucamo changes his name once he gets into Rome and he's sort of settled in and he's like, oh, Lucamo makes me sound a bit like an outsider. I don't want the same thing to happen here that just happened back there. I'll change my name to Lucius. And so everyone's like, oh, cool, that's really Latin of you. And <laughs> But it turns out that he's so, so rich already that, and Cosmarchius is like, actually, you already have way too much wealth. Like in our laws, um, that's more than you're legally allowed to possess. And Priscus is like, well, what if I give you over all of my excess wealth to help you run your kingdom and you let me hang out with you and I'll do whatever you want? And Marcus is like, sure, you can be in charge of the cavalry. Roger that.
And so Priscus distinguishes himself with his military prowess and ends up becoming really close friends with Ancus Marcius and an advisor and learning all of the ropes, really. So, you know, he's taken the sign that Tanaquil has read really seriously and he's like, you know, I need to really prep for this. If I'm going to be king of this place, I need to know how it works. I really need to understand the whole processes and to make sure I've got the right people on side. So he spends the rest of his time and his wealth um, currying favor across the board to sort of smooth the way uh, for the inevitable. (laughs) And it works. And it works. He ends up becoming the next king of Rome. But unfortunately for him, Ancus Marcius's sons seem to have expected that they would become the next kings of Rome, even though that's not how kingship works in Rome. Still can't quite mm. figure out why they're so disgruntled, but they are. Yeah, and it's so interesting, they... isn't it? No, I don't have anything to say. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just going to say, yeah, so Ancus Marcius's sons, when they grow up to be more adult, they end up orchestrating the assassination of Tarquinius Priscus, and it's pretty brutal. They basically get these two guys to like pick a fight. It's very Ocean's Eleven. I hope that people have seen that movie so they don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, they get these two guys to pick a fight. And then when he's trying to sort it out and figure out what on earth is going on, one of them axes him in the head. Ouch. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. yeah. But Tanakul quickly has him smuggled into the palace. <laughs> And Has she's him like, dragged off, axe in her, dragged off stage left with the axe still in his head. Yeah, and she's like, she's like, tis but a scratch. <laughs> yeah. it's nothing, it's nothing. He's totally going to come back from this. Don't you worry. Best medical treatment, you know, he's the king. We've yeah. got this under control, yeah. But really what she's trying to do is she's trying to make sure that the person she thinks should become king is in fact made the next king. So she gets this guy called Servius Tullius who has been actually, he's had a very interesting backstory. Servius Tullius was a slave, as far as we can tell, at some point in his life. Yeah. Um, And for some reason, he ends up being in the royal household when he is a slave. Now, it's possible that he and his mother were actually from an elite family in a place that was conquered by Rome and they became a prisoner of war. And as a mark of respect for their ex-status, that that's how they ended up as being part of the royal household. But nonetheless, this is all just trying to add frosting to a situation where he was a slave. Anyway, when he was younger, there have been a bunch of signs that Tanaquil has also interpreted that this kid is destined for something. He's going to be special. And so he's been raised in a very kingly fashion. You know, they've made sure that they have looked after him. And now it's time to reap the rewards. Tanaquil, I think, presumably wants him to be king because he does have these connections to her own family and she has been looking out for him. So I think he would be a good choice in the sense of he would be looking out for her and her immediate family. And that's probably why she wants him to be king rather than somebody else. So she orchestrates a situation where he is just taking charge while Tarquinius Priscus is totally still alive and totally just (laughs) recovering. And eventually it means that he is able to kind of just slide into the position of being the next king of Rome. So he does actually kind of take power in an illegitimate way. Rome's wild. It is wild, yeah. (laughs) Eventually he gets confirmed in the position. But yeah, that initial transition period, it was, yeah, really just a band-aid to a really crappy situation where the previous king had an axe in his head. Yeah, not ideal. Yeah, (laughs) but he becomes this amazing king where he contributes all these reforms. He's apparently the guy that comes up with the idea of having a census. So we have him to thank for that. Bureaucracy. The Romans are all over it. (laughs) Woo! (laughs) But unfortunately for him, even though he rules for quite a long time and he does preside over all these reforms to try and make Rome a better place, and with the people, he does seem to be a fairly popular king. Unfortunately, he's not very popular within his own household, and this is where it all comes undone. So basically, he has two daughters, and then Tarquinius Priscus, look, I'm not going to lie, we have no idea who these guys are. Are they his sons? Are they his grandsons? 
the math does not add up in any way that you look at it really we don't know who these guys are but they are related to him in some way and so the daughters of Servius had been married to the sons of Tarquinius Briscus I'm going to say all the grandsons whatever these relations but unfortunately it was a very sitcom situation where uh, amongst the daughters one of them was really shy and quiet and very prim and proper and one of them was just like this crazy ambitious you know like I want to marry the next king of Rome type of person and amongst the brothers you have the same kind of mix where one of them is pretty like you know good guy pretty chilled out and the other one is super ambitious kind of nasty as luck would have it Liv they are married (laughs) to the opposite personality type I was gonna guess (laughs) yeah I know no one saw that coming And it was not a case of opposites attract at all. (laughs) So eventually the two hot-headed, ambitious ones, they're like, hey, you know what? What if we just like kill our spouses and then marry each other? And so that's what they do. (laughs) Yeah, that is what they do. Why? I know, I know. (laughs) And so it ends up being the case that these two, now that they're united, now that they're officially a married couple, they start gunning for Servius, who is seemingly their dad or their father-in-law, depending on which one you're talking about. Does it seem to matter? They're like, we've got to get this guy out of the way. And so they start pointing out to people, hey, remember that this guy's a usurper? Like, I know he's been on the, you know, I know he's been on the throne for like almost four decades, but come on, he usurped it. Let's take it back. And Servius by this time is, is quite an elderly man. And when he comes to confront the younger Tarquinius, who will eventually be known as Tarquinius Superbus, the last king of Rome, uh, he basically picks him up and throws him downstairs and is like, get out of here. And then he sends some assassins after him and Servius is no more. And so we have this last king of Rome, not a very nice guy. He's actually, but at least he's universally nasty. He's nasty to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, there's nothing quite like chucking an old man out of, out of the building and being like, that's it. You're going to die. Yeah. He's not nice to aristocrats, but he's not nice to the poor people either. So he's he's very democratic <laughs> in that sense. <laughs> Which leads us to, I suppose, thinking about Superbus, and it's like, because the Roman kings do come to a bit of a sticky end. And yeah. uh, Superbus, so he's known as Superbus. This translates as the proud uh, because he does not give any f's about anything he will do exactly as he pleases hugely arrogant and this trait seems to also be shared with his close kin as well so this becomes a real issue because like you've got a bully essentially in charge and he's bullied his way into it and also his kids and the next generation coming up have learned from him that this is how you do power Mm. and so they are insufferable in what they think that they can get away with essentially and this is where we come to the story that we have told you about before of the ideal roman woman which is the story of lucretia we won't go into all the details but she also has a horrible story but it is an important one as far as rome is concerned so essentially one of superbus's sons sextus i mean it's really tragic in english that he's called that but doesn't mean what you think it means (laughs) <laughs> so Sextus but does he up... have five brothers and sisters or brothers I guess we don't actually hear as much oh. as we should about his okay. brothers like we only really hear about a couple of other ones don't we Dr. G yeah we don't sort of get the whole gamut but oh. yeah I who knows I think you've got to if you've got that kind of name but... I know I know <laughs> otherwise it just sounds really unfortunate exactly but anyway yeah he can see the passion for this Roman matron called Lucretia who is obviously married if she's a matron and she's actually even technically married to someone who might even have connections to his own family bit bit different in different versions but anyway he decides that he's going to rape her he manages to overcome all her attempts at resistance he rapes her she is left absolutely devastated by this because a roman woman as with most women in the ancient world expected to be extremely circumspect in their behavior. They're definitely not meant to go around sleeping with other men. And so after passing on news of what has happened to her, to her close male relatives and one of their friends who also has connections to the Tarquin dynasty, she kills herself because she's like, I can't, I can't live and be this example of a woman who committed adultery or is guilty in any way. 
And they decide, right, that's it. This is the final straw. These people are just too awful. They've crossed the line. And so they end up showing her body to the public and really getting the people turned against the Tarquin dynasty. And not only that, but kingship in general. So not only do they kick the Tarquins off the throne and, you know, fight, they actually end up fighting wars for years to try and keep them out of power, but they actually take a vow that they're never going to have kings again. They're like, this is just too awful. We never want to yeah. see this kind of power at play in this place ever, ever, mm. ever again. Yeah. If only they could have seen Augustus glimmering in the future there. I was going <laughs> to say. You're mentioning my man? You know I am. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> yeah, and so that's how that's how the, the kings come to an end. And whilst they do end up having emperors, they're very careful not to call themselves Rex. Very different things. It's yeah. a very oh, different thing. Yeah. Very different, yeah. Not just the word at all. <laughs> yeah, not at all. That's why Caesar was even killed, right? Because they were like, he's trying to become a king. Oh, there are so many people. Like, this is what we're finding because we've now... We've we've written this book obviously about this period that we have covered, but at the moment we're about a hundred years into the Republic. I'm being a bit mm. generous; we're not even that far, but almost a hundred <laughs> years. Uh, we're almost a hundred years into the Republic, and already we've had I, I would say at least like almost ten people killed because they were apparently aspiring to be king or make themselves king in some way. It's a constant thing. The Romans are like, wait a second, you look They're- like you're trying to make yourself a king. We have to kill you immediately. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the Romans do have this uh, issue with the term Rex at this point. And it's kind of fascinating because they do have some priesthoods that have Rex in the title. And Mm. it's a very delicate negotiation, being like, no, no, that's about the sort of previous kingly function, priestly kingly function that was at play, that we definitely need to preserve our relationships with the gods. But heaven forfend, we do not need a king. No, no, we shall not have one of those. (laughs) Yeah, it's so interesting the way they, like, develop these kind of feelings towards the different ideas, but I don't even know. Like, just the way, like, the the, the actual role of people can be very, very similar, but you've really got to watch what you're calling yourself. You, you do, do, but I Language suppose is the, important. Yeah, I suppose the other thing to keep in consideration is that even though they do end up having, you know, about 500 years later, a kind of similar system with the whole emperor thing, What ends up happening, obviously, is slightly different in that what Augustus ends up establishing is, in fact, a hereditary dynasty, which is not Mm -hmm. what the kings were, even though there were these interesting connections between them. I kind of get the feeling that's more like powerful families and there aren't that many of them. So it's it's not really a requirement that you have to be related in in that way. But Mm -hmm. also what you continue to see when you have emperors is that the Romans don't hold back and we'll assassinate you if you are a bad emperor. So they still have that thing of, hey, you know what? We're going to just assassinate you and there's going to be a new dynasty potentially coming after you because we're sick of this dynasty. Yeah, like checks and balances, but only in the form of assassination. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) That's Rome precisely in a nutshell. (laughs) Yeah, perfect. (laughs) Well, I think that's that's us done, really. Well, I, I love learning Roman history. I mean, history generally. But the it's so interesting to me how many are like vaguely mythical. Just the idea that Romulus technically counts is great. I love that. I love a good myth becoming reality. Feels Absolutely. very Theseus, only like probably even more reality than Theseus. And I support that. <laughs> uh, like, well, we, we love telling the stories about these people. And as we said at the beginning... We hope very much that people are interested in learning about the stories because sometimes we can verify them. Uh, Sometimes we just think that they maybe happened in a different time period. So the time period we're talking about is about 753 to 509, according to the dates that have come through. But we think that some of the stuff that they're talking about with the kings actually did happen. It just maybe happened maybe a bit earlier or a bit later. And it's just about over time, the Romans have kind of tidied up the stories and made them a bit, you know, a bit neater and a bit more straightforward to tell so we hope that if, uh, if your listeners like hearing about all these crazy stories, there are so many more in the book. And we're really all about telling it as we see it. We, we like talking in you know normal, everyday sort of language and just like our podcast is. 
Yeah. I mean, that's why we all get along, right? So exactly. Talking history like it's actually silly and ridiculous and fun like it is, because that is absolutely the best way to learn history and mythology without all the stuffy dry. 100%. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's you, us, ancient history fangirl, the explorers. Exactly. We're all on that bandwagon. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. We've got like our little team. We always show up together and people's, I was noticing in Spotify wrapped and stuff. There's so many that's like, people just listen to like the four of us. It's so fun. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, hell yeah. <laughs> Also, like women talking history, it's the best because we are left out of it. So we might as well study it after the fact and like talk about it that way. Well, that is something we've highlighted. Yeah. And I have to say, that's one of the, the, yeah, one of the incredible things about this period as well is just how prominent the women really are. Because once we get out of this sort of regal period into the Republic stuff, all of a sudden we're back with like, lots of dudes all the time and where is the place for women in that and there's there's not a lot in that sort of political system to be honest whereas when we're talking regal period we're talking about families and those connections really matter and having figures like Tanakul come out super Mm -hmm. important and she plays this really huge role not just in sort of setting up the possibility of Priscus becoming king but also like this sort of foundation for Servius Tullius as well. So it's, yeah, it's really fascinating to see the women really come to the fore in these kinds of stories, I think. Yeah, and we hadn't realized how much there was that parallel between like the late Republic and the early Empire, because when you start to get individual men, you know, stepping forward from the throng, (laughs) that is the Republic, then the women who are associated with them also start to become more prominent and people are more interested in what, you know, how they're behaving, how they're conducting themselves, the role that they play, how the men relate to them. And it, we suddenly realize, oh my God, of course, it's like very similar in the, in the regal period, because you do also have individual men, you know, paying more of a role, which opens up the door for women to feature more prominently, because again, people are concerned about how are they behaving? How are they not? And something that was highlighted by one of our sources, Peter Keegan's amazing book on on women and Livy, is that the women do tend to appear at these really interesting moments of crisis and transition. Mm. And so it's really fascinating to see the part that they play and then to look at how late Republican, early empire writers are interpreting that because they're seeing women like Fulvia and Livia and that sort of thing. Right. So it's the inherent like nature of the the sources too. The sources are so familiar with the the empire women and then so they are more able to like see the women in the earlier time yeah oh, 100%. I love that. yeah 100 yeah, yeah. It, it makes me think of like why i really enjoy ovid as a writer too because he is also interested in women he like sees them as people who have feelings and like <laughs> what a rare concept in ancient sources but you know he is he is also of that like very early empire time and and like exists around women who are more prominent I guess so that's oh yeah no look we're, we're, we definitely have noticed that as we've been covering the republic to be frank it's a total sausage fest I and we, we miss seeing the women so <laughs> yeah you gotta hurry through it to get to the empire we're, we're Going getting as there, fast we're, as we getting can. there. Yeah, yeah. we're getting there <laughs> oh I love it well why don't you tell my listeners more about the like the book details itself title where they can get it all the good things absolutely it is called rex the seven kings of rome which is a subtitle that really irritates dr g but we're gonna (laughs) run with it (laughs) i've argued i think there's nine kings guys (laughs) it's like how i talk about the olympians there's 12 but actually there's 14 yeah like there's 12 well, like there's 14, so I'm with yeah, you. No. The, the, the subtitle is purely to avoid confusing everybody. So yeah, yeah Rex, Rex, the Seven Kings of Rome, and you can actually purchase it directly through our publisher. We go on with independent publisher, so woo, yeah. support independence. And we're an independent podcast, obviously. And so you can buy that through the Highlands Press website. And there will be a link in this episode's description. So they Absolutely. can click right through to it because- yeah. Yeah, I mean, history books are great. History books written by women and written in an accessible way by women uh, are just all things perfect. So I'm thrilled that you guys have this. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, well, hopefully it'll be of interest because, I mean, the writing itself is designed to be accessible, but it is also 
uh, footnoted. So for people who are like, you know, I'd like to follow up on that story myself, mm-hmm. you know, you can definitely, there's plenty of source material to refer back to as well. So it's not going to leave you hanging if you're, if you're curious as well about where something came from. So, I mean, there's lots of sort of interesting stories in the chapters and then there's lots of additional info tucked away in the footnotes. Good. Yeah, and, and I don't know it's not end notes. Perfect. Yeah, exactly. And we'd also <laughs> well, like to give a shout they might out. be end notes. Uh, oh, no guarantees. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and we're still working like on the sh- layout. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we'd also like to give a shout out to our illustrator, who is also a, a female. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we've got a really amazing up and coming young female illustrator, Bridget Clark, who's done an amazing job drawing illustrations for each chapter which will hopefully capture the essence of each king oh that's great yeah Yeah. love i mean illustrations in history books are great generally but also i also i mean i didn't get to choose my illustrator but that it was also a woman and then with my second book that our mixologist was a woman too i was like all right we're just doing this like (laughs) let's go for it so (laughs) i'm with you (laughs) and of course the listeners can find our regular podcast Mm -hmm. at all the good podcast apps and you can find us at the partial historians.com and we are on instagram we're hanging in on twitter for now but we're also branching out into other <laughs> platforms because who knows what's going to happen there mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. nobody <laughs> knows what the future holds <laughs> no no so yeah, we're hanging God. in but we're also starting to expand out into uh i think mastodon and those other yeah, sorts of platforms. Yeah, we'll see what happens to us. Yeah. I mean, you'll find yeah. us somewhere. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we're around. And then they can Search for the partial historians and we're out yeah. there. Yeah, we yeah, are yeah. out there. And also I wanted to point out to you because we kind of sort of half referenced it throughout, but um, we have done a couple of uh, bonus Patreon episodes, which is where you guys told the story of Lucretia in more detail, as well as um, the founding of Rome. And we kind of compared and contrasted the founding of Rome story with the founding of Athens, which is like so wildly different in (laughs) wonderful ways. I'm still Uh, getting over that one. (laughs) I know. Like it's just, yeah. I mean, Athens is such a unique, weird place. Um, (laughs) But I mean, also so is Rome. So we'll take it. Uh, But yeah. And then we also did uh, the sort of quote unquote, like ideal woman of, um, I guess that was Lucretia when, when I compared it to, to Penelope. Um, which is, yeah, so that was very fun. So my listeners also, if you're on Patreon, can find more episodes. And I would also love to do more of those with you guys in the future. So maybe there'll be more. I think we're going to have to. I think it's reminded yeah. me how mythical all this Roman, early Roman history is. Yes. And therefore, we're definitely going to have to do that next year. <laughs> Perfect. Well, and now that I know more about Sparta, hopefully I'll be able to pull some of that into. Absolutely. Love it. Yeah. Um, well, thank you guys so much for joining me. It's always so much fun to talk to you. Thank you so much for having us on the show and letting us talk about our book. An absolute pleasure. (laughs) Oh my God. So happy to. Uh, nerds, thank you for listening. As always, you can find more about the Partial Historians and their work and book through links in this episode's description. They are the best. You should follow them and you should buy their book and listen to their podcast. Rome's fun too, I guess. Let's Talk About Myths Baby was written, is written by me. Wow, I can't speak. I'm not going to fix this. Let's Talk About Myths Baby is written and produced by me, Liv Albert. Michaela Smith is the Hermes to my Olympians and she handles so many podcast related things like editing some conversations so that I don't have to spend a, as bazillion hours on them. And I love her for that. God, she does so many things. Stephanie Foley works to transcribe the podcast for YouTube captions and accessibility. The podcast is hosted and monetized by iHeartMedia. Help me continue bringing you the world of Greek mythology and the ancient Mediterranean by becoming a patron where you'll get bonus episodes and more. Visit patreon.com slash mythsbaby or click the link in this episode's description. Just a reminder on Patreon, every month I put out a theme and I get patrons to ask questions and then I answer all of their questions in long and rambling episodes where I talk about literally everything under the sun it is so much fun we have a great time you should join us you are all the best thank you for listening I am Liv and I love this shit Mm